you for inviting me here today. So I, I am um, Managing Director of um, Lima UK. We're the, uh, the local branch of an international trade association which represents everybody active in the licensing business in the areas of copyright and trademark, largely associated with consumer products, it has to be said, consumer products and services. Thank you, my clicker. Yeah. Why don't you set this thing? <laughs> I'm doing tri triangular sourcing here, yeah. so you get a definition of it. Um, so our members are licensors, as we call them, which are uh, organisations that create and sell intellectual property rights. Licensing agents, and we'll talk a bit more detail about them later, but specialist agents for people operating in the field. The licensees, who are the manufacturers and marketers who buy the rights for their consumer goods, and various support organisations that go along with the, the framework of the business. Head office is in New York. Yes, last year was actually our 30th anniversary as a TA. And we have branches in many parts of the world, including locally, Germany and the UK. Uh, about 130 members in the UK, it's probably about 140 now, in fact, so about 1,200 worldwide. So like any TA, we have a, a variety of benefits for members, including discounts off the exhibitions that we uh, sponsor around the world. Uh, and we're probably most famous for networking events, which are always a lot of fun in the licensing business. So I know you've had a cup of tea, but I usually they say, can we start with a bit of instant networking and just turn to somebody either in front of you or left or right and just introduce yourselves, please. <laughs> That's all the networking you get in these 20 minute speed presentations. <laughs> Break the eyes. So I'm going to explain a little bit um, about what licensing is, what kind of licensing we're here. I'll explain the licensing industry to you and why does it exist, why do people want to buy and sell intellectual property licensing. We'll talk a little bit about the way the deals are shaped and then in case you're particularly interested in licensing out uh, the art that you create with your company, we're going to talk about how you would probably take first steps in going about that. Uh, so first of all, if you look up the Collins English Dictionary definition of licensing, this is what it tells you, the granting or giving of official permission to do something. So it's a fairly straightforward definition of what is a fairly straightforward business. And in our terms, licensing is where a manufacturer buys the rights from somebody who owns IP, it could be uh, TV shows, films, sports brands, greetings cards, publishers, uh, and we call that the license, the permission to do that is the license essentially. Now, I always, we'd like to remind ourselves, if we're in the business, that members of the public don't necessarily distinguish between licensed goods and not. I don't know if any of you saw Super Shoppers about 10 days ago. They did a piece about brand licensing Europe, the show there, and, and they, they were making that point themselves, in fact. But um, shoppers will go into a store and they will buy products which may or may not be licensed. This is a good example. This is a fromage Frey brand that's very big in the UK. Uh, called Frubes, made by the French dairy company Yoplait. That product is on sale all year, but last summer they did a huge license promotion with, I'm sure, characters that you're familiar with, Minions. That was about 98 million tubes of um, from my trade were sold featuring the Minions. That's a low price product, a carton of nine Frubes is about a pound. And th this is by no means the most extreme, but you'll have to forgive me for particularly bringing this one in, because this is a business I'm involved in personally. Uh, these are licensed Bluetooth speakers featuring Star Wars characters and they retail for £129 each, so rather different from Froops, but they're both in the licensing business. So those products just sit on shelves competing with non-licensed products, own brands, brands and, and the like that you find in the appropriate retail outlets. And we often talk about licensing as a business of the 21st century and we certainly believe that, especially when uh, a country like the UK might struggle with to, to, to exist as a manufacturing base because of costs. IP rights, no matter where the products are sold, no matter where they're manufactured, right, money still comes back to UK PLC if the company owns the rights there. So, 21st century business, but well, it's been going on for a lot longer than most people think. And this is a, a particularly good example, Beatrix Potter. I think we're going to have a new Beatrix Potter book published at the end of this year, in fact, one of their anniversaries. But they had some merchandise on sale within a year of the publication of the very first Peter Rabbit book in 1904. Um, 
Probably the most famous example of um, early-ish uh, licensed merchandise is uh, the Mickey Mouse watch uh, that was made um, by Ingersoll in 1933, so five years after Mickey uh, was created. And in fact, that watch was um, credited with saving the Ingersoll company. They weren't in good shape at the time, by all accounts. A um, bit closer to home and a bit, bit, bit closer in time, Paddington Bear has been revived with the movie and more to follow. Uh, but 10 years it took them to get some merchandise out on the market. And one of my favourites, and in the, in the topic, in the news this week because of George Martin's uh, sad uh, death, uh, the Beatles, uh, they didn't know much about licensing in the 1960s, their manager didn't. They famously sold worldwide rights to all their merchandising just for 10% of receipts. Uh, and the company that bought that, those rights was called Celtabe, which crossword puzzle as amongst you will undoubtedly recognise the word Beatles backwards, and it's reckoned they lost about $100 million of revenue over their lifetime by doing that deal, so get yourself some good advice if you want to do some licensing. Uh, fortunately, they did, they did sell one or two records, I'm informed, so they weren't on their uppers. And uh, just to show you that how things can have longevity, that's a Beatles lunchbox from 1964, uh, but as recently as 2014, Thomas Pink won one of the Lima Awards that are handed out in Las Vegas for their, uh, as a design award for their range of Beatles shirts, which that's a particularly graphic one. So, new 21st century business, but been around for a long time. And this is the licensing industry. How is it shaped? I mentioned licensors, the companies that create and sell intellectual property. So, people like Warner Brothers, uh, Close to Home, BBC Worldwide here. They're famous, BBC is famous for things like um, Doctor Who, of course, and um, some years ago, Teletubbies. Big um, uh, producers of and marketers of intellectual property rights. But many people who create IP, in whatever format, they don't have the resources, they don't wish to get involved in the marketing of the IP themselves. So they will appoint a specialist licensing agent. And here's a couple of examples. CPLG is one of the oldest and probably still the largest uh, licensing agent in Europe, um, with something like 45 staff based in London, with offices all over the place. By contrast, Rocket Licensing is a, a company about eight years old, boutique agency, four staff, both of them do a very similar job, but in rather different styles, as you would imagine, from a large and small organization. And those are the people who provide all the services to sell, market, and so on and so forth, IP rights, for rights owners who either can't or don't want to do it for themselves. So after that, the rest of the chain really is the licensees, the people who buy the rights to put on consumer goods. Uh, whatever form that distribution then takes, direct to retail or otherwise. And finally, we have the consumers, of course, who, upon whom the entire industry uh, depends for its survival. So that's the life of the industry in the shape. We analyse it in the, into a number of different sectors. Uh, the most popular usually year in year you know, is what we call entertainment, which includes things like characters, movies, TV shows, animations, and so on and so forth. And there's our friend, the Minions again, who was so big last year. Uh, sport is a big area for licensing. Tiger Woods no longer quite the, the drive that he was, but that was a special logo they created for Tiger Woods merchandise. Brands themselves uh, are very ever-present in licensing, like Cosmopolitan magazine, for instance. And some of the uh, not quite so big ones, but still very important globally. Uh, fashion brands, the majority of, um, if not all, of products with Calvin Klein on are licensed to third parties. There isn't a big factory somewhere making Calvin Klein stuff. I'm afraid it's all third-party licensing. Again, consumers don't necessarily know that or need to know it. Music um, is a big area for licensing. We mentioned the Beatles. This, I like this example though, because this is the, uh, anybody been to the Disney Florida where they have the rock and roll coaster? I think they've also got it in Paris. This is a great example because Disney are the world's biggest licensor themselves. They know a thing or two about licensing and entertainment. They put a rock and roller coaster in one of their theme parks but they don't leave it at that. They decide it will be more successful if they buy a license from the rock band Aerosmith to brand their own rock and roller coaster, their own uh, roller coaster. So I reckon if you can license a rock band onto a roller coaster, you can license anything, basically. Um, art, which is where some of you guys will come in, is a growing sector, particularly in visual products like uh, decorations, wallpapers, home furnishings, and so on. And even charities now are slowly getting to grips with the way that licensing can work for them. Uh, rather than just endorsing suppliers, they can do licensing uh, deals now to bring in revenue for the charity. So those are the main sectors of licensing. Uh, but why does this go on at all? Why do companies um, license out? 
Well, the first reason is to boost awareness for the core intellectual property. So if you're a film company, for instance, like Warner Brothers, and you're putting out a new film as they are this month, for instance, Batman vs Superman, they will be spending literally tens of millions of dollars worldwide marketing and advertising that film. But if they can get themselves a dozen or 20 or 30 manufacturers to make products using the imagery from that film and put them into retail outlets where the film itself would not get any exposure, like supermarkets and toy shops and, and uh, any way you can think of really, uh, that very presence of those, pro of those uh, products boosts awareness in the consumer eyes, consumer's eyes and gives the movie uh, company another chance to sell a ticket for the movie. And indeed, that activity can also be an aid in the marketing of the core IP because a lot of those 30 companies that buy the rights will themselves spend marketing money on promoting their products to retail and consumers. So it's like additional dollars being spent on your brand. Um, this is a phrase that I particularly like, which is borrowing the competence of your licensees. We don't have time uh, today to go into the difference, as we would see, between brand extension and licensing. But if you do it yourself, it's a brand extension. If you decide that you're a great film company, but you don't know anything about greetings cards or toys or stationery, and you license manufacturers in that sector who already have the skills, the knowledge, the contacts, the experience to optimize the opportunity, then the skills of those licensees are being put at the benefit at the disposal of your brand. So you are borrowing their competence to benefit your business and you get paid for it at the same time, which seems to be a pretty cool model to me. So uh, licensing is definitely an alternative to brand extension for um, manufacturers or indeed for rights owners. Somewhere along the line, some money will be made out of that. Uh, it might be a profit center in its own, in its own right, something like the BBC, revenue goes really back into programming because that's their fundamental uh, rationale. So that's why people uh, sell licenses, why do companies buy them? But the one that everybody thinks of, of course, is to increase sales, and clearly that's a very good reason to buy a license. If you're making coffee mugs, you may well decide that your white coffee mug will sell in greater volume if it has an image of Homer Simpson on it, for instance, and you'd probably be right. But it's by no means the only reason uh, to buy a license. Licensing helps to increase your profile uh, with consumers sometimes, but maybe equally as importantly with the trade. Uh, an example, anybody here heard of the Finsbury Food Group? Now, Finsbury Food Group is a £350 million a year food conglomerate uh, with factories in several parts of the UK. One of their subsidiaries is a company called Lightbody Cakes, who happen to be the, the UK's biggest manufacturer of licensed birthday cakes. So you've never heard of Finsbury, you've probably never even heard of Lightbody, but if you've bought a Spider-Man cake, or a Teletubbies cake, or a Manchester United cake, you've bought one of their products. And so in their trading with their uh, big supermarket customers, being associated with those powerful brands, helps their profile and their entire business. And so for them too, for licensees like Lightbody, buying into this instant brand power that the license gives you is an alternative to them to actually uh, developing their own brands. And licensees, probably more than the licensors, the most fundamental reason to be involved is to make some money out of the whole thing, of course. So that's the whys and wherefores. Um, how do we go about uh, processing the business? Now I mentioned licensing agents and to some extent a licensing agent is to intellectual property what an estate agent is to bricks and mortar property. Uh, the parallel being that most people who own bricks and mortar property don't sell it and market it themselves, they use an agency to do it. So um, licensing agents perform that function for IP owners but of course it's not like usually selling a house which is a one-off transaction, it's more like rent in fact where the licensee agrees to pay a percentage of the value of each product they sell bearing the intellectual property rights they bought the license for. Uh, we call that process royalties. Royalties is the lifeblood, the cash flow of the licensing industry. And it's the fundamental agreement that you sign uh, financially on your contract. There is one other little thing called a guarantee that I'll explain in, in a moment, but basically royalties is where it's at in money terms. So if royalties is the driving force of the business, how much is paid in royalties? Well, there is a wide range across the whole business. Um, at the lower end, uh, like the example I just showed you, fast moving, low margin product like yogurt or fromage frais, you're talking about low royalty rates, three, four, maybe 5%. Uh, high royalty rates tend to occur either when it's a very easily commodified product, like say a rock band t-shirt, easy to make, 
the manager of the rock bands know they're easy to make the margins high, they'll probably ask for a, a high chunk of royalty to pay for that. And in fact, I've even seen the royalties occasionally as high as 30% in some extraordinary circumstances. Um, everything's up for negotiation, but the average licensee, a person buying uh, rights, is tending to budget for around about 10 to 12% for most of uh, the business that they will do over their lifetime in the licensing industry. Uh, if you, in terms of where you guys are at, it's important to remember that licensing is all about awareness and the most powerful brands have the most um, marketing potential for licensees, so they'll get the higher royalty rates. Um, oh, not quite uniquely, but almost uniquely, in the art area, which would include things like greetings cards, you will sometimes get a licensee who 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 want to buy rights to your artwork because they just love it and they think it will fit in with their product range. Um, but their point of view on that would be that they're probably going to help you with, you with awareness even more than you do, so they're going to add to the awareness in a big way. So they're probably not going to be willing to pay certainly somebody new in business anything like ten percent. You'll probably have to settle for. A, a lot less than that in the early stages of the business if you do get involved in selling rights for licenses. Uh, just quickly, the minimum guarantee. Um, minimum guarantees were devised originally by the publishing industry to stop people buying licenses for an agreed royalty and then doing nothing about it. Because if you get somebody who agrees to pay you 10% of their invoice value and then they don't sell anything, well, 10% of nothing, of course, remains nothing no matter how long they have that stand. So, a fixed sum of money that will go to the rights owner at the end of the day, whatever happens over the term of the contract, is what the guarantee is for. It's not meant to be a huge crippling advance that will make it difficult for the licensee to finance the rest of their operation. It's usually worked out with a bit of science, simply by uh, doing a sales projection on what you think you're going to sell under the license, multiplying that by the royalty rate. If it's two years, you'll come up with a sum, and let's say your royalties over two years are going to be £20,000. You may well be asked to guarantee, or if you're selling the rights, you may well be able to ask a guarantee for some, something like 50% of that um, as a guarantee. Again, in the early days of licensing out greetings cards are, you won't be in a position to drive those type of bargains, and I would advise you not to, because it will just block the chances of doing business. But that's how they're calculated usually, with a bit of science anyway. So I said we'd address particularly the circumstance where some of you guys in the room may be thinking about licensing out uh, the artwork that you've got. Greetings cards, um, not uniquely, but they're one of the categories that's involved in licensing in rights from third parties, but also licensing out as well. And the first thing to just to remember if you do decide to try and license out what you own, is that you will be facing competition from all these guys. You'll be facing competition from Disney and the BBC and Warner Brothers and Manchester United, and the England and Wales Cricket Board, and anybody else who's got some IP that they could sell to those book publishers, or toy companies, or stationery companies, or bed linen companies. So there's a hell of a lot of competition out there for you. How would you go about it, though, in the first place? Well, if you want to license out your IP, you need these things, tools like this at your disposal. You need the right sort of contacts. Do you know who buys licenses for the different categories of merchandise? You know how to frame a legal agreement to both handle the license and to protect your rights having done so. Do you have the special sales and marketing knowledge within the licensing industry that will allow you to do that? Do you have the ability and the resources to manage the financial side, including the royalties reporting and collecting the money from your licensees? And can you monitor and approve the artwork and the creativity and the, the pre-production process of your licensees? Well, pro probably the answer is when you start, certainly you don't. One or two of you may, but you probably don't. You could buy yourself in some expertise and staff up to do it, of course. Uh, and that's where you start to make the decision of whether doing it in-house or trying to find yourself a licensing agent. Uh, first thing to say is, people, some people say, I'm going to keep it in-house because I'll have more control. I just want to reassure you that even if you do appoint a licensing agent, you can keep just as much control as you like really depends on how hands-on you want to be with the process of licensing out your artwork. Some uh, rights owners are not very hands-on, they're happy to trust it to their, license, to their agent, others like to be involved all the way through the process, so it's very much up to you. Um, if you do keep it in-house, can you really do it? And you've got a serious overhead commitment probably to get on with it. Now, what people quite often say to me is that of course the problem with uh, appointing an agent is that it is a big chunk of the revenue goes to them. 
but they do have all the expertise that you need. And so, again, I, I, I remember talking to some GCA members before, and they were horrified at the idea of, of an agent taking 30 to 35% of revenue, because I know that's not what you pay say, sales agents, for instance. But this is a completely different type of operation. As you can see, that, they, that's, that's that list again. But those are the jobs that the agency does for you. And they do it having had a lot of experience already of doing it, so you can slot into their operation uh, quite quickly. There are more than 100. Uh, licensing agents in the UK, large and small. And the last thing I'll say on agencies is that um, quite a lot of our members are agents, but quite a lot of licensees as well. So I don't particularly have an axe to grind over why you should use a licensing agent. But if you do, remember, you're not marrying them. You're, you're appointing them for three or four years, that's all. So during that three or four years, you can learn a lot about licensing yourself, at the end of which you may want to bring it back in-house. Or if the relationship is going swimmingly, you can reappoint the agent. Or if you think you've earned something about it, but somebody else can do better, you can appoint a different licensing agent. So you do retain a lot of flexibility for the rest of uh, your business in the licensing arena. So just one last thing to talk about, which is creating licensed products. If you get involved in this, either as a uh, buying rights for the cars that you publish, or a licensing your rights out, somewhere along the line, somebody's got to produce some products based on your artwork. Uh, and nearly any license worth its salt produces something called a style guide. Uh, this is a couple of pages from a quite an old-fashioned type style guide because it's printed and bound in a book. Often nowadays this is an online resource that you'll be given usernames and passwords to access. Um, but this basically does two things, this particular two-page spread featuring the, the Flintstones. First of all, it shows you the colours, the Pantone references you need to reproduce accurately. Uh, the Flintstones characters and make them consistent across the whole output from Warner Brothers who own the Flintstones. And it's also showing you the relative size and dimensions of the principal characters. So for instance, if you took a t-shirt design in to Tesco, uh, in which Barney was taller than Fred, uh, and Tesco agreed to buy 10,000 pieces, uh, and then you took it back to Warner Brothers and said, you can't make that t-shirt, Fred's got to be bigger than Barney, guess what, one of others won't buy the one with Barney's big, Fred's bigger than Barney, and you're back to square one, you haven't got yourself an order. So you do need to stick within the style guide. Um, it doesn't mean that creativity is completely gone, however, but in the approvals process, as we call it, licensors do want to look at every stage of what you're doing, whether it's a printed piece or a three-dimensional um, <coughs> manufactured piece. You need to keep them involved all the way through so that eventually the product that you finish will be approved and will not run in NT any problems like that. So whether it's proofs, strike-offs, pre-production samples, uh, sketches, whatever it is in your production process, get them signed off by the licensor or do that yourself. You're on the other side of the equation, examine what your licensees are doing. And that's, I, I highlighted that rather joke example of Tesco because you do have to be careful to satisfy the needs of the licensor and the retailer. Uh, it's best really if you can avoid it not to show a retail customer an unapproved design in case they do like it and you have to change it. Uh, we all know that sometimes you do have to show them something to get a commitment. If you do, make it clear it's a not yet approved design, so you might be coming back to them with something a bit different down the line. Uh, I've just come hop up, for, hop up from the new Teletubbies launch over at Westfield, but just to show you that that's just a silly example of something that would not have been approved uh, by the BBC back in the day for uh, Teletubbies. They do a promotion with proofs, but they wouldn't do a promotion with Heineken, for instance, so keeping within what the licensee tour will approve is all important, essentially. So a, a few frustrations, but hopefully not too many. Okay, folks, I think my time is up, so that's a very brief introduction to licensing. I hope it's been stimulating, and I wish you every success if you decide to take it on, whichever side of it you do. Thank you.